We've reviewed some of the most important concepts of inferential statistics so far. P-values, alphas and confidence levels, and the thinking behind our statistical tests, trying to show statements as being false as opposed to proving them to be true. All of these concepts are applied on samples of data that we take from larger populations. So let's take a step back and take a look at some of the important concepts of pulling these samples in the first place. The first topic that we'll look at is determining our sample size. When budget or resources are not a limiting factor, a general rule for determining sample sizes is that, for many common cases, a sample of 30 or higher is sufficient. If you can push it, 100 is even better. In most business cases though, a limiting factor for sample sizes is our resources. We have to keep in mind the overall budget of a project, as well as how much it costs to generate a sample from the population that we're interested in. If your budget is a bit more flexible and you know your population size, as well as a desired margin of error, then you can refer to a table like the one below to determine your sample size. You can find lots of tables like these or calculators with a search online. These general rules and tables are a good place to start. Just keep in mind that there are factors that might drive the need for larger samples. One such fact, as we discussed earlier, is the confidence level. If we are aiming for a higher confidence level, like 99% or even 99.9%, then we require a larger sample size. It's also good to use larger samples when you have a population with lots of variants, like there is with a high-risk investment, for example. Or if you're measuring variables that occur in only a small portion of the population, you need much larger samples. This could be comparing 1% or 2% open rates of two emails in an A-B test, or measuring for differences in cancer rates in two populations of mostly healthy adults. With these scenarios, you're unlikely to see even one positive case in a sample of 30. You'll need to increase the sample size, maybe by several orders of magnitude, in order to get a large number of positive cases in your sample. Another common scenario that you might face is when there are lots of variables that you want to use to split your data into smaller groups. Applying these variables as filters, like certain categories of products or segments of customers, are going to shrink the sample size. If the overall sample is quite large, it is going to provide the flexibility to do more focused research on smaller samples that fit specific variables of our larger population. Earlier in the chapter, we reviewed the p-values of the four experiments that we ran on our tree saplings using different fertilizers. One thing that you may have noticed is that we generally saw smaller p-values when we used larger samples. To further explore this idea, let's take a look at the following tests. In each test, there is a 10-point difference between our two groups. However, as our sample size increases, our p-value decreases it becomes more and more clear that the difference is not the result of randomness. In fact, when our sample hits 1000, we become extremely confident that our two samples are different. This reinforces the idea that larger samples are nearly always better than smaller samples. To understand why, you need to remember the law of large numbers. This law states that as our sample size grows, the mean of our sample moves closer towards the true mean of the entire population. Essentially, the more observation we have and the larger our samples, the less likely it is that we get fooled by randomness. This law is frequently illustrated with dice rolls. We all naturally understand that each side of a six-sided dice has the same probability of appearing as long as the dice is fairly weighted. Ultimately, because of this feature of dice, we'd expect the average of a large number of rolls to be 3.5. When you simulate dice rolls, getting a mean of exactly 3.5 is actually fairly rare. You tend to see some variation from the mean due to randomness. But how much variation we see depends significantly on how big our sample is. After one roll, your average can never be 
it's not possible as a result. After 10 rolls, we might have an average closer to 3 or 4, but it's quite common that it's a bit ways off, 3.5. But as we increase our simulation to 50 rolls, then 100, our measures tend to move closer and closer to the true mean. By 200 rolls, you tend to get a number very close to 3.5 in simulation after simulation after simulation. Another key concept of taking a sample from a population is the central limit theorem. To illustrate this, we can go back to our dice rolling example. Let's ask 100 different people to each create a sample of dice rolls for us. We know that the true distribution of a fair dice is uniform. Each result from 1 to 6 is equally as likely. So for this test, each person will roll a fair dice 10 times. Each person represents one sample. Person 1 rolls their dice 10 times and gets an average value of 4. Person 2 rolls their dice 10 times and gets an average value of 2. And each of the 100 people do this, generating an average value of their 10 rolls. As we plot the first few, it can look pretty random. But once we reach about 30 samples, or people in this case, look what happens. The distribution of sample means is starting to approximate a normal distribution. And so this is the central limit theorem. As we increase the number of samples, the distribution of the sample means begin to reflect the normal distribution. And this happens regardless of the shape of the population. And this isn't just true with dice rolls. Test scores, income, marathon times, no matter the distribution of a variable within the population, the means of samples of that variable will be roughly normally distributed, given the sample size is large. And this is a beautiful thing. With a large enough sample size, our sampling distribution will be well modeled by the normal distribution. And this allows us to apply certain statistical tools, such as the empirical rule, on our samples for any population. Another aspect of the central limit theorem is that as our sample size grows in size, its spread decreases and the spread of our sample means will be closer to the true mean. This makes sense if we consider the law of large numbers. As the size of our samples increase, their mean tends towards the mean of the population. Let's use this Excel workbook to further explore some of the earlier concepts in the chapter, the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem. We will control the different aspects of the workbook with these controls here. There are three main elements, the distribution of our population, which we see to the chart to the left. Right now it's normal, but we can set this to some different distributions. I'll put this back to normal for now. We have the number of samples, which we see in the smaller charts underneath here. Right now we only have one sample, so only one box is filled in. But if we have two samples, we see that we have two boxes. Let's move that back to one. And finally, we have the sample size. This changes the size of the samples in these smaller charts. Right now, we have a sample size of 10 bars within this one sample, but if I increase this to 50, we can see that we have a larger sample size. Let's bring this back down to 10. Over to the left, in this chart underneath our distribution of population, we see the distribution of our sample means. This takes the mean from each of our individual samples, from each of our smaller charts, and it plots them within one chart here. We will start this exercise with a population distribution of normal, one sample, and then a sample size of three. Let's start by reviewing the law of large numbers. So the law of large numbers states, as our sample size grows, the sample mean becomes a more accurate representation of the true population mean. From the visual representation of our sample here, we can see that the three observations were selected from our population. The mean of the sample of just these three observations is plotted in this chart to the left. 
With a low sample size of just three points, we can't be very confident about the accuracy of our sample mean, and it is currently quite a bit different from the population mean above, 8.13 to 6.98. So let's increase our sample size to 10. And we can see by comparing these two charts, our mean of sample means is becoming closer to our population mean. And if we increase our sample size to 30, it becomes a bit closer again. And if we increase it to a sample size of 100 and a sample size of 500, as our sample size increases, our sample mean is becoming closer and closer to our population mean. Now let's explore the central limit theorem. Recall the definition of the central limit theorem. If the sample size is large enough, the distribution of sample means will approximate a normal distribution, regardless of the shape of the population distribution. So here our population distribution is normal, we have one sample with a sample size of 10. Since we only have one sample, we only have one sample mean in this chart for our distribution. So let's increase the number of samples. Let's increase it from one to five. And now we have five samples that we're plotting the means for. Let's increase this to 10 and to 25. And let's increase our number of samples to 50. And notice how we're increasing the number of samples, even with a relatively low sample size of 10, our sample mean is becoming closer to our population mean. It's a pretty good estimate. And we can also see the shape of the distribution of our sample means is becoming closer and closer to a normal distribution. The first part of this definition states if the sample size is large enough. To so explore this idea further, we need to consider these second and third definitions underneath. So if our population is not normal, the distribution of many sample means can be assumed to be approximately normal only when the sample size is greater than 30. So we'll keep the sample size at 10, but let's reduce our number of samples to 10 as well. So we have 10 samples with a sample size of 10. Let's change the population distribution from normal to a Poisson distribution. And when I do that, when we look at the distribution of our sample means, we can see that it doesn't really look like that normal distributed bell curve anymore. But let's increase our sample size to 30. It's starting to look a little bit more normal. And if we increase our sample size to 50, we can see it is looking more normal now. So even though our population distribution is not normal, as long as our sample size is big enough, we're going to start to see a more normal looking distribution of our sample means. Let's change our sample size back to 10 and our population distribution back to normal. Let's look at this final box. When the population is normally distributed, the distribution of many sample means can assume to be approximately normal, even with a sample size of less than 30. So right now we have 10 samples with a sample size of 10. And as we increase the number of samples this time, we can increase this to 25 and 50 and 100. We start to see that this is approaching a more normally distributed shape. So even though our sample size is quite small with a sample size of 10, which is definitely less than 30, we're seeing a more normal looking distribution of our sample means because the population is normally distributed. As we have seen, a large sample is important, but we have to be aware of bias in our sampling. Sampling bias occurs when our data is collected in such a way that certain members of our population are either overrepresented or underrepresented in our sample. For our fertilized tree saplings, imagine we have workers helping us plant the trees and apply the fertilizer. Let's call them Clark and David. Clark has been planting and fertilizing trees for years and knows how to do it properly. David is just starting out and is still learning on the job. Because of this, David's trees are less likely to be planted and fertilized properly, and this could affect their survival rate. Now imagine that we have Clark 
plant all of the trees and use fertilizer A, and that David plants all of the trees that use fertilizer B. Do you see how this could be an issue? When collecting our samples, it is important to do so in such a way that it represents the population as best as we can, and reduces the chance of bias. There are two main techniques to achieving this. The first, the ideal type of a sample would be a representative sample. A representative sample adequately represents some chosen characteristics of the population. This type of sampling works best when we're very familiar with our population and know the important characteristics to control for. For our trees, we know that the experience of the planter is important, so we can ensure equal representation by having Clark and David each plant trees from both groups. The second technique, which might be a simpler approach, works even when we aren't familiar with our population, and this is a random sample. With this method, we select samples at random from the population, trying to ensure that each member of our population has an equal chance of being selected. Random samples are very unbiased. They can allow us to get close to that representative bias without much guesswork. Perhaps we have 10 planters plant 10,000 trees. Each tree is randomly assigned a pack of fertilizer and a coded tag which can tell us which fertilizer it was. If this is a blind test, we won't even tell the planters which fertilizer they received. Next year, we'll come back and use the tags to measure our survival rates. Because everything was random, neither group should have had an advantage when it comes to the different variables in our population, like the planters, the terrain that they were planted on, or the amount of sunlight in their area.